friends, welcome to E3 and to a different type of documentary from Noclip. We've spent most of the past three years covering the stories of how games are made, but more recently we've been asked to show how games are covered too, the work of journalists, websites, influencers and YouTubers. So given that E3 was coming up, we thought this was the perfect opportunity to shine a light on all that work and the evolution of the biggest conference in video games. E3 has continued to evolve since it first began, but over the past couple of years it's gone under some more drastic change. So instead of coming here and covering the games, we thought it might be more interesting if we covered kind of everyone else around the games. The, the press that cover the show, the influencers who do the same thing, media companies who broadcast it to the rest of the world, and yes, of course, the developers too. I spent years dreaming of coming to E3, and if you're watching this video, the chances are it's on your bucket list too. But while in recent years the event has sold tickets to members of the public, there's only so many people with the means to buy one, let alone fly to Los Angeles for a week. So here at Noclip we thought we could do the next best thing, and bring E3 to you. I absolutely love coming to E3. I love reporting on it, I love meeting people, I love the long lines, I love how sticky it gets in Los Angeles and how tired you are at the end of the week. Uh, it's something I wish everyone could experience, so uh, consider this video your sort of digital ticket to the biggest show in video games. Uh, and unlike if you had a badge, we're actually going to go a bunch of places that most people don't get to see. So uh, strap in and welcome to E3. E3 celebrates its 25th birthday this year, so here's a short history lesson before we head to the convention center. Prior to E3, most software and hardware companies piggybacked on CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. But the games companies were always given the worst areas of the convention center show floor. Famously, Sega were once put in a tent that leaked and destroyed a bunch of Genesis systems. Around that same time, the IDSA, which would later be known as the ESA, was formed to unify the games industry and to establish a ratings board in response to a request from Congress. They also formed E3 and convinced the biggest hardware companies to forego CES. And so the inaugural Electronic Entertainment Expo opened in May of 1995. And apart from a couple of vacations in Atlanta and one week in Santa Monica, it's taken place in the same place it calls home today, the Los Angeles Convention Center in downtown LA. E3 has changed a lot since the mid-90s, mostly in reaction to how the media reporting on the show has evolved. Over the years, the business-focused press conferences lost their bar charts and started to talk directly to consumers. Online streaming has created a 24-7 reporting cycle, while social media and platforms like YouTube and Twitch have allowed more people than ever to cover the show. But it wasn't always this way. In fact, if you were watching an E3 press conference in the mid-2000s, the chances are you were watching on GameSpot.com. So who better to talk to about the old days of E3, the next GameSpot host turned video game producer, Rich Gallup. Rich Gallup. Daniel Dwyer. My man, how you doing? Was that too awkward? Did we nail that okay? No, I don't know. Shake? Can we try it again? Uh, let's do it again. Where do you want to do it? Rich Gallup. Daniel Dwyer. <laughs> That was, that was worse. <laughs> You're like kind of the reason I love E3, because I used to uh, watch the GameSpot live show from my little bedroom in Ireland. Before live streaming was a thing, like now there's like Mixer and Twitch stuff all yep. over the place. Uh, you guys were setting up uh, shows from the show floor. It was like magic. I can uh, only take me. a fraction of the credit. Uh, to me, I just, you know, there are a whole bunch of talented people who set it up and I just got to stand in front of it. But I love that we are feet away from the loading dock where we would have to carry everything by hand <laughs> right. because if you tried using a cart, the union laborers would stop you because that's their job. So oh, you're kidding. So we would have our booth on the floor, as you know, and these are towers and CRTs and everything. Every single bit had to be carried in by hand or over your shoulder. If you, if you can, try and go back to what it was like covering the show then, because these days you do an interview on, on the show, you can kind of easily just like chop it up into a VOD that goes up on yep. the website as well. What was it like back in the days of so, tape? Yeah, when I, my first E3, I was an intern, and I think that was 2003. Okay. And uh, what you had to do was uh, E3 just like go, it start, and you'd run, you'd have two different jobs. One was the runners, and your job was to go to each booth and find their media desk, which not everyone had back then. Okay. Just, like find the person who can answer things and say, do you have any B-roll? Do you have any press stuff? Do you have anything? Because there's no like FTPing, there's no previous stuff. It's like you're getting a physical thing. Like a CD, like or, a a, CD or a tape? Or a beta, beta tape or, or something. <laughs> and you get whatever this thing is, and then you sprint it back to the uh, booth because there, is, there, are no, uh, there are no NDAs, there's no release embargoes. It's really just who is fastest. And whoever got theirs up first would win. 
that, so it's like you and like IGN people just yeah, like exactly. sprinting around. And then you get it and then you bring it back and you have to figure out like, all right, how do I decode, how do I rip this thing and turn it into something digital? Okay. And you know, when, then we have to process it into like Windows media files and real media files. And so it was this really weird, awkward thing. And then uh, if they didn't have, that would, you were lucky if they had that prepared. Uh, if they didn't have that prepared, you were actually taking a camera and you're setting it up in front of a television because that was the only, like, the most amazing game you've ever want to see is right here on one TV. Right. And so you set up your camera and you're trying to square perfectly, white balance it perfectly, focus it perfectly. And if you're lucky, again, their TV has a headphone jack so you can plug in your, your wire. Yes. And if you're good, you get, uh, you make sure the audio isn't blown out and then you capture that and you just play it for as long as you can. Right. And then you run back and you're like, I have, 30 minutes of cameo elements of power footage, and you're like, okay, I'll chop that into 30 different one minute videos. Well, that's we'll the thing, all up because you can't put up like 30 minute videos on the internet back then, because yeah, no, like no one wants to download that either. No one wants to watch that, it would take forever to buffer, so yeah. And like, or like, you're lucky you get up buried in a hundred like WWE or WWF back then screenshots and you throw those up and it was, uh, it was awesome. Yeah. Like, it was so exhausting. Were you ever involved in like uh, recording or streaming from the actual press conferences themselves? Oh, for sure. Or like, uh, so that one thing GameSpot did back then, we were the ones responsible for streaming the press conferences. Like nobody really did it before no, then. We, we were the official partners to do it. Right. So it'd be like, if you want to watch the Nintendo E3 press conference, you have to go to GameSpot or Nintendo.com and you're showing our stream. Mm. And so like, Reggie's first appearance, like it was in backstage, like, and like, oh, by the way, there's like links sword and shield that Miyamoto's about to pop out and we're just messing with it. And now of course they all handle that themselves, but it was it was utter chaos. Like we had uh, giant suitcase machines that we got from the military, I think. Okay. Like they're like rugged eyes, like laptops that you'd see, you know. Like sat phone stuff? That's what sort it of looked like. Yeah. But it's just a computer for streaming and like, all right, this is the one to handle Windows 150K stream. <laughs> this is the one to handle Real Media 300K stream. Let's plug all this in and uh, yeah, run wires, run cables, a big ugly mess trying to get in like, oh, you're the guy who controls the video feed for the arena? Well, we need that feed, we right. need this audio feed. Uh, all right, we're about to get run over let's by truck. That's E3. Yeah, that's E3. Thanks, Rich. Take Appreciate care. it. <laughs> Take care. See you. Nice seeing you, man. These days, E3 is spread out over the course of a week, but it can be split into two halves. The first half is when the press conferences happen, and the second half when the show floor opens. And this divide has caused problems for people attending and reporting on the show. So traditionally, most of the live streaming shows were done from the E3 show floor. The problem with E3 being this sort of longer thing now that happens before the doors open is that then people can't broadcast until the press conferences are over. So then what happened was a bunch of game sites had sort of satellite offices that they did before the show opened. That's kind of all gone out of the window now. At this stage, IGN has a remote studio. Uh, most of the big game sites that will report on the press conferences won't actually be going to the press conferences. And places like YouTube and Twitch now broadcast throughout the weekend leading up to E3 from places like here. The Ritz-Carlton behind us is where Jeff Keighley's YouTube show is on. That's actually why we're here, because I'm going to be on it in just a few minutes. And what's happened now is that it's all sort of mixed in together. So while oh, everyone's broadcasting, uh, the press conferences are happening literally across the road. The first kind of big one, I guess, that's hitting, uh, we had EA Play already, but that's, that was kind of a smaller thing, is, is Xbox. So to cover the press conferences, you can either go into the press conference and then you're basically struggling with internet connectivity with every other person who's in there, or you can do what effectively every big game site does, which is stay in your hotel or Airbnb or in the lobby of, uh, of a nearby building and uh, live tweet and report it from there. So once we're done talking to Jeff Keighley, we're gonna go grab the folks from Waypoint, or Vice Games as they're known now, and head back to the area Airbnb and show how they cover the entire event from a place that might as well be where you're watching the live streams in your bedroom. Another thing that's changed with E3 is the range of people covering the event. While the bigger game sites like GameSpot and IGN bring large teams, and YouTube and Twitch broadcast from expensive stages nearby, the floors are also populated by freelance journalists, influencers and YouTubers. While we were waiting for Vice Games to finish up at a nearby Behind Closed Doors event, we bumped into some folks covering the event solo. Khalif Adams from the Spawn On Me podcast and popular gaming YouTuber SkillUp. Covering the show solo comes with its own set of challenges, so we asked the guys how they do it, and crucially, why. How many E3s have you been to? This is my fifth E3. And did you always have a press pass? No. So the first year, I went under uh, Kaja Inc. Which okay. Was 
the fake Vistaprint business card that I had. This is had. A, yeah, before like you could get like a buy a pass, this is how any of us got into E3, was yeah. just make up a company. Yeah, seriously, it was like Content Inc. is the thing that I do, and I write a whole bunch of stories, which is like two stories at the right. time. And I was like, can I get into E3, please? And they were like, yeah, okay, fine, we'll yeah. let you get into E3. <laughs> how many E3s have you been to? This is my fourth. Fourth? Yeah. How did you get your first pass? Uh, Ubisoft flew me as one of their star players. Excellent. So they have a program where they actually take like small time YouTubers right. just to help build up the grassroots. And then the next year I was like, can I go again? And they're like, no, you're too big now. Like you've got too many subs. So Good problem you to have. You know? So I needed to find a different date, you yeah. know? Um, but that was my first time here. And it was, I'd always said to myself, cause I got into the game late as right. in YouTube. And I'd always said to myself when I was younger, E3 man, bucket list, gotta yeah. make it happen. And then Especially I was Especially I'm sure in Australia. Correct. Like, it like feels the other like, side of the world. Yeah. Exactly. Do you always go to the press conferences? Yes. I've uh, never been what are you to talking a press about? conference. Yeah, yeah. Because when I worked at GameSpot, we covered them all miles away. I didn't think about that. And since Noclip, it's like, oh, we, oh, we, we don't like live tweet <laughs> stuff like that. So what, tell me what it's like. You're going into the Microsoft. I'm going to go in the Microsoft one. Like, yeah. I love the spectacle. The spectacle is the thing that I always kind of attach myself to because that was the thing that got me here. You mm. know what I mean? Like seeing that stuff at home when you guys were covering all that stuff mm. and like seeing it in real time. But now I'm kind of sitting in the actual room it's such a different feeling. Man. Mm. It's like, I still have that fan feel of was like, what are they gonna show? Or all the things that we talked crap about two days prior to it, are they gonna show it? Yeah. Like, are they not gonna show stuff? What are the surprises? That stuff is, never gets old. Like, that stuff is still fun. The one question I feel like we were at, when we said we were doing the E3 thing, yeah. the one question we were asked more than anything else was, do they plant people in the press conferences <laughs> to like, go like mega hype, like, yeah, for like every single asinine oh, announcement? Man. Have you ever felt that? Um, the, the interesting part has been for the Microsoft one, has yeah. been the Xbox Fan Fest stuff. Right. Those folks are like genuinely just super hyped so anyway. They're just like Xbox fanboys that they cram at the front? They put them in the front, okay. which, is, which is good. So it's kind of planting, yeah. but it's not really planting because they're actually like really excited for it. Right. Well, see, one of the things when you were working for a big game site was that yeah. like, even if you were critical of people, yes. you were kind of so big that they couldn't not talk sure, to you. Sure. Do you ever feel like, because like some of your stuff is like, you know, it's pretty critical of games oh, yeah. and stuff, oh, right? Look, I'm, Do you I'm, feel pushback from people oh, yeah, ever? Like I know, I'm on two blacklists. I'm really? able not, I'm not able, I won't say, but I'm definitely not able to attend some stuff right. because of it. I won't see you at Bethesda later, is it? You won't see me at Bethesda, you won't see me at one other one. You can probably guess which one, but um, and look, I think that comes with the territory. You just need to always be 100% honest with your right. audience, because if you ever lose that, you're screwed. Yeah. And that means that sometimes you don't get those bookings, but at the same time, I get developers reaching out to me being like, dude, you must come to our thing. Right. I watch your channel religiously. I love that honesty, you know, and even if I am critical of what they say, they say, that's totally fine, man. Mm. You're, you're going to love what you see eventually, or you're going to love the other thing you see from us. And it really depends a lot on the PR teams right. and their sort of, I won't say mat not maturity is not the right word, but like their outlook, you right. know, and some of them have a really great outlook and they get it. You've got to roll with the punches and some of them are very much like, nope, shut it down. Yeah. And that just comes with the territory, but as I said, it doesn't ever hurt us mm. because if you ever look like you're not being real with your audience, then your channel's finished. Right. That's it. Do you get a lot of channel growth out of uh, E3? Um, not so much because you're really competing with like IGN and GameSpot and right. they get a lot of the clicks. It's so, actually no, um, we really don't. It, uh, it, I guess you would say a lot of YouTube channels focus on commentary yeah. um, versus news, so to speak. Right? Yeah, so why don't you just stay in, it'd be a lot cheaper. Correct, no, we, 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 we sacrifice clicks and revenue and whatever to be here. Because yeah. it's really important just to be here, I think, you know, mm. and just like meet people face to face and experience things. But you can't compete with IGN and GameSpot or whatever in terms of traffic. Right. Like they are going to just destroy you, but that's okay. Like we all play different roles and, and this is their moment to shine. Right. And when it comes time to like review a game, that's generally when we take over. You know? <laughs> so, and when I was here the first time, man, it was just like, it was incredible. Do you still have the magic? Oh, 100%. Yeah. I just I said it's exhausting, so much work, so ridiculous, the politics and the drama or whatever. But like, dude, this is the center of like, you know how we, we both feel this way about video games. Yeah. And this is like the mecca for one week where everything that matters is here. Yeah. And it's incredible. Austin Walker, Patrick Klepek. What are we doing this morning? We are at E3. Um, That's true. We, I guess we're at pre-E3 still, technically. Pre-3. Pre yeah, the Xbox briefing is today. We just came out of, this goes up weeks from now. Yes. Right? 
uh, a behind closed doors thing that let us we saw some Nintendo games. Cool. Uh, so that's the direct before. That is the direct, and then some hands on with stuff. We cool. saw Luigi's Mansion uh, cool. three. He's in a hotel. Uh, so yeah, that's like one of the things that happens, right? Is like the event for us often is like you get here on Friday or Saturday and you start doing the kind of early events like EA Play obviously was yesterday. We yeah. didn't go to that because that this year especially seemed like not a thing I needed to be to be mm -hmm. at. So but yeah. today's a weird day because it's like it also exposes like the tiered like right. press access part of all this, which is like a handful of people go to this Nintendo thing that we just went right, to. Right. Other people will still have like booth appointments and maybe some interviews, but like this is like a certain section of like the press which is like more like traditional press, right? Like there's yeah, no mostly. no Who like no YouTube influencer. Spot. Yeah, like like the like kind of like old guard sort of like more traditionalist Game press spot. That, that we are definitely a part of. But I, like yeah. no no vlo you know vloggers. There's no one from YouTube. There's no right. one from Twitch. Um, is that because of embargoes? Do you think? Like almost um, certainly, Nintendo doesn't fuck around. With that that is probably true. But also, Nintendo is historically like just a traditionalist conservative company. Right. Like it's more of that stuff is like the like the Mario Maker mm -hmm. stage. So it's just it's just a weird part of like like different outlets both based on like legacy history with the company go to stuff like and even then there's also, there are also sub tiers of this which is like so we were there and then i was also talking to other reporters who are sticking around to come interviews, do interviews which we are not we doing did, we did not get those interviews no. right, okay <laughs> Um, but look, that's another thing with that is like I also think that Nintendo understands that that event is not useful to influencers, right? right. That's not a capture event. That's an event where it's like, you're prepping news posts to yeah, go up alongside ex exactly, the announcement. Exactly. For us, it's great because it means we can probably record a podcast about the Nintendo Direct tonight or tomorrow right. privately and not have to do that in the morning of Tuesday where we want to be getting out to the show floor. So what is what is the press conference situation look like for you guys? Do you all just sit there and watch it? Yeah. Are you like ordering who's like uh, writing which news story? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we mostly do well, podcast. Like, well, this we'll, year's a little bit different because we we're doing a lot more work alongside Motherboard, the right. tech website at, right. at Vice. Um, you know, as part of kind of a fold-in thing, they do a lot more newsy-based stuff. Like, you know, traditionally Waypoint has been you know more the hoity-toity, you know, big features and stuff like that. Um, and, and sort of critical analysis pieces, but you know, news does good traffic. Oh, yeah. And so um, it's less that I will be writing a news piece as much as like we will be in a Slack channel with the motherboard people being like, okay, hand this off to this freelancer, right. hand this off to that freelancer, and not covering like a granularity of like a Kotaku or a GameSpot. Wow. Uh, so couches, strange no statues. No um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of art in this place. Uh, watch your step here, coming up with those. Here's our like podcasting and, and streaming space that we've set up. We have it set up for four right now, and then Kato, who's our producer, is on like the production station over there. So, it's been a very leaky E3, yes. I'd say. Like, every E3 there are leaks. This year there's leaks, there's leaks, there's the leak discourse, which we talked about last night on the podcast. The like, is a leak a spoiler? Is a leak right. ruining presence? Gamer E3. It's yeah, does it doesn't ruin like, E3 for people who are waiting for the... Right. Elden Ring, like the new From Software, uh, Jordan Martin game, like, those games, like, mean a lot to Austin and I. Right. Like, the announcement of a new one is, like, a, like a moment in my life. Like, mm -hmm. I get so excited to see what Miyazaki has planned next. And so I didn't mind that, like, the, the name came out or I know the collaboration with Martin. At the same time, if you, like, told me right now on your phone you had the trailer, I would not watch that shit. I, right. Because mm -hmm. I want to be... I was like, in it. Yeah. I want to be on Twitter, okay, losing my mind with everyone else. Like, I find being a part, this is part of like growing up on message boards. Yes. It's like, totally. like, I want to be in like the explosion right. with everyone. You like, want the page number to go from 12 to 14. You never even saw a page. Yeah, I want to see the page memes happen gone. in real time as yeah. I'm excited yeah. and participating in like the kind of, like that, that part is exciting to me. That sure. said, as a reporter, it's also like, the video game industry is overly secretive. Fuck that bullshit. Fuck that bullshit. Like, of course you're making another call. Stop getting excited for Who cares? commercials. Yeah, totally. And, and like trying to find the balance there between like understanding reveals as a product or as a work unto themselves. Mm. Like, so we just got back from Nintendo, right? And Nintendo uh, released, it announced two Smash characters mm. that are coming up. Um, and both of them are cool. The second one is one that I've known that's been leaked for a while, uh, or that sources told me, I guess, a, a little while ago. And the way that they did it was really trolly and funny. Was it this? Is it this? Is it this? And then like, no. That was really funny. And so I think that there is value in like thinking about those things as a work unto themselves. Mm. It's happening. Okay. We're gonna do it. Let's I'm gonna get a computer. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Ten. There's a counter. 
the war room. Like it's like a React video. The joining Xbox Studios is Double Fine Productions. Wow. That's a great pickup. Fancy Star Content. All the content. All the content. Look at the grave! Look at the grave! That's what I'm saying! Hell yeah! What was the bounce about? So, yeah, watching Blair Witch. Yeah, if they, if they made a Blair Witch video game, would. Oh, you'd be fucked. Well, they did. They, 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 they made three of them and they scared them. the shit out of me. Yeah. Rustin Parr. Yes! Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, dude! I replayed a couple of them like years ago and they still scared the shit out of me. Yeah, they're quality adventure games. Yo. Wait, that is... Oh shit! What? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, boy. Let's find out. This is... This, there's no way. It's... They're just playing with me, right? Yeah, they're <laughs> fucking with me. I almost just threw my fucking God, laptop in. Oh no! <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I guess I'm in the Fuck spoilers, man! I'm telling for this shit! <laughs> Samurai. We have a city to burn. Yeah, there it is. No Ooh, bad way. Uh, that was good. That's good. That's casting. <laughs> He's everywhere. Is that oh, him? Oh, him? Is he there? Oh! It's good, it's good stunt casting. Oh it is really good stunt All casting. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, this we should take. Uh, yeah. CT Project Red. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna <laughs> say the <laughs> Fred. <laughs> yes. All the sound bites. It's just a hard All right, folks, it's almost time to hit the show floor, but first, an important health warning. E3, like most conventions, is a place where you go to get sick. By the end of the week, most of the attendees will have contracted some sort of illness. And after years of covering the show, I have my own strategy, namely washing my hands and trying not to get too drunk. But the best laid plans of mice and men didn't care about that when I contracted food poisoning after going to a local eatery right after the Bethesda conference. So I'm gonna be in bed trying to get better before the show opens, but don't worry. Jeremy, Noclip's cameraman slash the guy who brings me OJ when I'm sick, is gonna head over to IGN's temporary E3 studio to show you how they film E3. So I leave you in the capable hands of Corrado Corretto, who's gonna take a few minutes away from pre-production to give us a little tour. Hey guys, I am uh, Corrado. I am the head of entertainment video here at IGN. It is day three at E3. It is 8 a.m. We've been here for about an hour and we have the Nintendo Direct showcase in about two hours. So we are wrapping up rehearsals. I'm gonna take you guys around really quickly and show you kind of what it looks like behind the scenes here on a production day right before we start airing. This is our war room. Uh, we call it our war room because this is basically where all the strategizing for uh, editorial and uh, games in general happens. That's where we broadcast uh, our live stream as well as the press conferences that are going on. All right, this is basically post-production. This is where all of the packages come in out of the field and they're sort of turned around and edit. It takes about anywhere between half an hour to, you know, as much as two hours, depending on how complicated the shoot is. They put a bunch of B-roll on, on whatever shot outside and then it comes over to the stage where we basically roll it live. Arguably the most important piece of this whole operation, crafty. Right over there, that's where the food goes. We have really good like lunch and dinner spreads uh, and coffee, 24 hours a day. The day at IGN starts super early, so it's very important that we have 
the best in the business doing makeup over there. I've seen what the talent looks like before they sit in those chairs. This is an absolute must. This is the what we're calling the writer's room, and I use that term loosely because uh, none of us here are technically full-on writers. Everyone here is more production. We do a lot of writing, though, and this is basically we all hide in this room during the press conferences, and we watch everything right here on this monitor, and we work in a single Google Doc, and we just sit there writing up notes. We do it in real time. We have about an hour to like figure out what the talking points in the post show will be, and literally we run from here to the stage, and we are inputting those notes into the scripts as the show begins. It like happens instantly. So this is the IGN stage. We have about a half an hour left before we have to shut down and prep to go live. So we are finishing up um, some final pieces of uh, rehearsal. That's Max Scoville. He's one of our hosts, one of our producers. Um, he is currently rehearsing catches and tosses to the press conferences. That's Sydney Goodman. They're shooting the daily fix. Yeah, no, that doesn't happen live. That's actually pre-recorded. And then we kind of roll it in later in the day whenever it gets completed. The irony is it's all the news throughout the day and it's the first thing that shoots. It's 8-11, that thing will be done by 4 p.m. And it looks like we're just wrapping over there. That's where all the producers sit. We kind of like are all plugged into the Rundown Creator, which is basically the hub of all of our scripts and, and footage. And we're working off that in real time. Oftentimes, a developer will cancel um, and we'll have to move things around and it's pure pandemonium. A dozen or so bodies back there, some working audio, some working scripts, some working B-roll, some working graphics. Uh, we have a TD that's switching. Uh, we have a director that's calling all the shots, and then you have a couple of us producers that are sitting there just trying to like stay one or two steps ahead of the whole show uh, and make sure that it doesn't kind of fall apart uh, when the changes come. But overall, I mean, it takes a village. There's, I would say there's probably like a good 20 to 30 bodies in here at any given moment during the live show. And these things last between five to eight hours. So there's no movement sometimes. For hours on end, we just sit in those chairs and crank and crank and crank. And that's kind of what it takes to bring you guys E3. All right, well, as you can see here, we're just moments away from actually getting started. So I gotta get to work. Uh, if nothing else, tune in and see what it looks like when it all comes together. See ya. For many people, E3 is the press conferences, when over the course of a week, developers and publishers parade their wares in front of the public, and we collectively vote on their worthiness. It's a bizarre tradition that is unique to the world of video games. People around the world stay up to ungodly hours just to be a part of the live conversation on social media, message boards, or their favorite Discord channel. But here in LA, E3 hasn't technically started yet. The show floor doesn't even open until the final press conference has started, Nintendo's E3 Direct. And it's then that the focus turns to reporting at the event. Journalists rush to meetings, gamers line up early to be first in line at their favorite booth, while publishers, developers and investors meet behind closed doors to strike deals. E3 is buzzing with activity from the moment the doors are open, so we should probably give you our special tour as early as possible. Hello friends and welcome to the Electronic Triple. We're here at E3. Um, maybe not as busy as you might expect because these are the secret hours uh, before they let, I guess, uh, all the people who have gamer badges in. Uh, for a couple of hours in the morning, people who have either media or of course industry badges or exhibitor badges who are here showing off games uh, are allowed into the conference uh, to get their work done. So we're gonna uh, use that time where it's a little bit less busy, a little bit less loud to give you a tour of the two main halls that consist of E3 2019, the West Hall and the South Hall. These names have always been very confusing to people because the South Hall is both more south and more west than the West Hall. Also, there is no East Hall or North Hall. So why they decided to call them those is anyone's guess. But we're not here to talk about semantics of halls. We're here to talk to you about E3 2019 and the state of it, I guess, because everyone we've heard who's been in and, and especially specifically here in the 
West Hall has uh, talked about how empty it kind of feels. Microsoft and Sony were sort of toe to toe here for a couple of years. Microsoft were traditionally in the other hall and they sort of moved up here with Sony and Nintendo were here as well. And then the other one, the South Hall was kind of mostly for uh, third party studios, sort of the bigger Activisions and EAs and stuff like that. And of course, Many of those aren't here now either. So uh, we're going to do a tour. I'm going to try, uh, I guess, best summarize what it's like being here at E3 in both halls and also kind of, I guess, historically what it was like in both halls and how it's changed over the years. Uh, the other great thing about being here is that you're constantly bumping into people that you recognize, either people in the media or people uh, in development or on the PR side. Uh, so we're just going to constantly grab folks and talk to them about uh, their experience of E3 over the years, uh, how 2019 is different, and uh, what this year has kind of felt like specifically. I keep forgetting that one. you got to flip it around. When you walk up and it's backwards, they hate that shit. The other E3 tip is immediately get rid of the piece of promotional art that they give you. It's usually Persona. It was like Persona for like eight years in a row. But uh, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games this year. Sorry, guys. Yeah, this is already completely different to previous years. The Nintendo booth was always this big, sort of massive one over here, but this this was definitely, like I think Atlas was here before. You can see they're behind Nintendo now. But obviously Nintendo's gotten bigger. Uh, the other thing is that IGN's booth used to be here. GameSpot is still there. I guess they've all shifted up one. But IGN doesn't actually have their on, on the show floor production setup anymore. So that's obviously left a massive big gap as well. So yeah, this was the famous Xbox PlayStation sort of shot. I guess it was this shot actually, shot reverse shot, of uh, which was every E3 thumbnail forever. I guess Microsoft moved to the Microsoft Theater just down the road, so that happened a couple of years ago, um, and it left a bit of a gap here. And then uh, Sony's booth just seemed to get bigger and bigger. It was about a quarter of this entire uh, show floor here in, in the in the West Hall. So when it, when they said they weren't going to be here, it was kind of like, oh, who's going to fill that void? Is it going to be Activision or EA or is Nintendo's one going to get bigger on this side? Esports zone over this side and Respawn, which is not Respawn, who are making <laughs> Apex Legends. Let's keep walking. I'm really interested to see what's over there. I think Reb Ford from Warframe is on the stage at GameSpot. There's our friends from GameSpot hosting an interview with Rebecca Ford from Digital Extremes. They had Hugo and Marty from id Software up yesterday. Now with IGN gone as well, they're basically the only people who have been live streaming from the E3 show floor for like the best part of, what, two decades, maybe more. Uh, so yeah, shout out, shout out to my old employers. They're still doing the good work. Reb Ford. Pleasure to see you here. I am very glad we crossed paths. I know. Now it's time to talk. Uh, this is your first E3 in a couple of years, right? I have not been to E3 in five years. Oh, so, when, so when was the last E3? What was going on? Uh, the, we were a launch title on the PlayStation 4. Right. So we were in the PlayStation 4 booth with, uh, with Warframe. Which was like maybe where we're it standing right now. It might have been right here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a different time. So maybe six years ago, actually. Because right. Because uh, 2013. Yeah. So six, not five. Your initial impressions coming back in, how does it feel very different? It does. Um, we, like, I think the, for me, E3 is like the quintessential traditional gaming industry thing, and mm. we've gone totally rogue up in Canada. Right, of course. So for me, it's very strange to see it uh, in the flesh again. So, so I guess, why are you here then? Why, like, what's the benefit of, of, of Digital Extremes being here? Uh, well, to be completely hypocritical to everything I just said, <laughs> it's uh, we, we just to keep a little bit of uh, relevancy in the bigger gaming press. Uh, we like participating on our, you know, some of our favorite shows. Like PC Gamer was awesome. We were on yes. uh, the Giant Bomb podcast last yeah. night. With some Destiny folks. First time ever. Yeah. First time ever, uh, I think, in public with, uh, with Destiny. Now that they're independent, they're allowed to talk to us. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. But <laughs> <laughs> and since you're here, I mean, talking Warframe stuff, yes. what's new at Warframe? I'm so glad you asked, Danny. I'm happy to tell you that at TennoCon 2019 on July 6th, we're going to be uh, showing our crazy one-hour keynote with Tenno Live, where we're going to be talking about Empyrean and much more. So if you are a fan of Warframe, don't miss it. Awesome. People thought we were a marketing outlet before, they will now. So the one thing that's been constant with the Nintendo booth for the past few years is that they've always had massive, massive lines. Their booth, probably more than anyone else's, even before they started doing the gamer badges, was really gamer focused. Um, they started to focus on 
one major game on their booth instead of having like, you know, 30 or 40 different games to play from partners and stuff like that. They tend to have a lot of different uh, playable booths there and they get people in and out as fast as they can, but it's not really stopped the lines getting any shorter. Nintendo's kind of become the de facto start of the show now because the Nintendo Direct uh, happens right at the uh, opening of E3 and then they keep broadcasting stuff on their Nintendo Treehouse for the rest of the week. So um, it's definitely one of the more sort of fan engaged manufacturers. And I guess now with Sony not being here and Microsoft kind of having done their conference and gone like, they're kind of like the only one that has like a, I don't know, consistent heartbeat throughout the entire uh, E3 week. So back here, I guess we have the standby lines. Uh, so these are the lines for the lines for people to, to play uh, Zelda or Pokemon. At E3, there's never been that many like playable games on the show floor. It's never been about that. It was always a, a press event and an industry event. So stuff was like behind closed doors or by appointment. So it wasn't like you were just like wandering up to a booth uh, to play something. Obviously that's changed over the past couple of years. There's always been an element of folks who weren't in the press or, or industry. Like for instance, uh, GameStop managers for, for years, like we'd have loads of people who worked in the retail industry who would uh, get tickets to the event. And you know, they, they don't have appointments to go play games. So they go up and, and play stuff. But obviously with the introduction of these gamer badges and they're sort of opening it up into more of a fan event, um, it's, it's made the requirement for, I guess, more games to be made available. But as you'll see, this isn't as big as PAX. It's not that type of show. So kind of when you're at E3, it might make a bit of sense to get in the line for a couple of hours, uh, especially if you're gonna play like a Nintendo game that people, you know, no one else in the world is gonna get a chance to play. Nintendo always has the best carpet at E3. Isn't it beautiful on your feet? Don't you just wanna take your shoes off? It's like going through the pits in a Grand Prix. You just gotta like walk through the Nintendo booth to feel alive again. So this was always where all the techie kind of stuff was, the Nintendo um, media booth here, which is like one of the fanciest, nicest uh, media booths on the show floor. This is all by appointment only. This was also where a bunch of the, um, I guess, retail partners were forever. So you'd have all these stores here that were like selling this stuff, but there was no one ever, <laughs> there was never anyone like there to sell it to you. It was like a store with like, check out this amazing like Breath of the Wild a switch case and then you didn't want to buy it and you couldn't and it was because all these it, it was just because we're at a, like an industry event they were just showing it off because they had retail partners coming in to like buy stocks of this stuff and um, but with the change to again the gamer badges with like general public being allowed in now they actually sell shit so you can actually use your card and cash to, to buy stuff from people like satisfy yeah this is where this is where it feels like a totally different show they have all these like photo op stands set up, I guess. Real like Instagram culture kind of thing, but obviously they didn't really have these in years past. I mean, they had worse, they had booth babes, but this is like, yeah, this, this feels like a whole other sort of uh, uh, type of, of conference, maybe for the better as well. Hello and welcome to the concourse, the only part of E3 you can walk between the two halls without getting sunburned if you're Irish. Um, this is just a general walkway. It usually has some sort of uh, promotional material on it. Um, but if you're part of the industry, it's actually a really important place because loads of meeting rooms um, happen uh, in here. So a lot of the sort of uh, press demos and stuff like that, or a lot of the business meetings, they happen um, in behind these plants in here, in the jungle. Um, uh, and also upstairs as well. Um, but if you were a, I guess, a big massive video game nerd like I am, and I mean, you probably are if you're subscribed to this channel, um, this is probably the best like people watching spot in all of E3 because uh, basically anyone who's anyone who works in the industry, uh, press or developer or whatever, is gonna be walking up and down uh, this hall. So it's a great place to sort of uh, stand and wait to grab somebody for an interview. Like, I don't know, Tim Schafer. Hey, buddies. Hey, what is How you up, doing? My How are things? How are things? Congratulations. Good, thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're actually filming. Is... <laughs> I know. Congratulations on the acquisition. I give you my permission to use only the left side of my face, <laughs> not the right side. How does it feel to, um, I guess, um, be at E3 now that it's sort of in the shape that it is now? How many E3s have you been at at this stage? I think this is the first one. Okay. I, mean, I remember when it was CES. I think we went to CES and then it became E3, and uh, you know I've seen it. I've seen it many. I've seen it, I've seen it declared dead many times. Right. Yeah. And it always comes back to life because people want it to exist. So. Right. 
it comes and goes. It has its ups and downs and crazy years. And uh, like usually, it's like a place where we come to ask for money, right? Or try and sell games. Yeah. Uh, and we'll probably still be letting people know about our games, but they won't come. It'll be coming down here to ask for money anymore. Right. Which makes me like it more. Now I think it's more fun. <laughs> I could maybe have some time to go and play some games. Yeah, so we'll people always ask, like, what games do you see? What's the best thing you see on the show? It's like, I see the inside of a conference room or the entire show. <laughs> what are you doing today? Like, what does what a, a day at E3 look like for, for Double Fine? Well, we do, we were just on Mixer talking about Psychonauts, and then we have our booth where we're going to go talk about Psychonauts. We're going to do demos, cool. and then I think one more thing. Jack Black. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Later at the Coliseum, we're going to hang out with Jack Black on stage. When in LA. Talk about Psychonauts. When in LA. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, we're doing a doc all about E3, and we're talking to people about their games. So I guess it's only fair to ask you, tell us about Psychonauts, when's it coming out, and uh, <laughs> on what platforms and all that sort of stuff. Psychonauts 2 is coming out next year on all the platforms we said it's going to come out on, which is basically all of them. Cool. And I'm right in hearing that the story kicks off right after Rhombus of Rune. Yeah. So people should go play Rhombus of Rune right now. Yeah, go play Rhombus of Rune, go play Psychonauts 1, and also Rad is coming out uh, uh, August 20th. Awesome. Which is Rad. Five minutes into the uh, set hall here, and already this feels more like E3 of old. Um, just big boots from third-party publishers. Capcom, Monster Hunter behind us, the DLC. We got a massive Ice Dragon for their DLC pack. Uh, Ubisoft in the back, uh, Bandai Namco. This feels like more of the sort of pomp and circumstance of E3. So I'm excited to explore and uh, see what else is going on over here. Getting to the point now where I feel like we've done a documentary on every big publisher. We have Cyberpunk over here. here obviously, we did our Witcher series. Bethesda's over here. We just met Reb Ford from Warframe earlier. We've got WB Games here, which we're doing a documentary on uh, soon enough. And we also have Ben Pack, who our next documentary is, is going to be all about. Ben from Giant Bomb. How you doing, oh, my Danny. friend? How are things? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. What are you doing so early at the show floor here? Early, dude. I've already been. I'm seeing. I saw Crash Team Racing. I'm seeing some Namco stuff. I gotta get that hustle going. It's not like the old days where you're having to do write-ups for every single game, right? No. It's, it's mostly for podcasts and live show stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. We do our editor check-in every night. I like, I, you know, and I'm still taking notes and stuff and trying to process it all but I, I don't have to like you know go download some assets yeah. download a trailer put embed it embed some photos it's there's less pressure which lets you have more time to kind of experience the atmosphere in the games which is really nice cool. so what have you enjoyed so far this year what are the what games have stood out Ooh, um actually i just came from crash team racing and they are they're really going the extra mile with mm. that game so to speak so to speak Oh, I'm seeing Age of Empires 2 Remastered. That looks really cool. It does, and I was a huge fan of the original, oh, so sweet. I'm really looking forward to see what they have uh, done with that. Excellent. Hello, welcome to a, a, a booth that would have looked at home at any E3 that I had ever been to in the past. Uh, this is the Fortnite booth. Also, giving Nintendo a run for its money with the soft, soft, the soft, soft softiness. It's really easy on the feet. They really know what they're doing with this booth layout. It's got like, they're giving out like bags of popcorn. It has that like cinema feel. You know, it's kind of what Fortnite's always been about is getting together with your buds and having like a, a fun experience. And I mean, it's not like they can't play Fortnite at home right now. They're showing off a bunch of the uh, creator levels here. They have a spin -a rooney thing on it, which um, I'm gonna try go on. I think I could take these kids. It's awesome to see just how large this particular booth has gotten over the years. I remember last year walking up to Nick Chester, who does a bunch of the PR for, for Epic, and they had like a big Fortnite section in the Epic booth, and being like, wow, yeah, this, this thing really, really took off, huh? It like, keeps getting bigger and bigger, and like, now look at it like. It's not a good start. It's going so slow. Whoa. Look at that. Backside. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> hey, no. Wait, wait. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> All right, man. One staple of any expo I've been at over the past couple of years, uh, E3, PAX, kind of whatever, is that uh, Gearbox have always thrown in really hard. They've always done two things. One, they have one of the biggest statues wherever they are. Battleborn in the past was one they threw in really hard to. Uh, here we've obviously got Borderlands 3, a huge fan favorite. The other thing they always do is focus very much so on getting uh, players time with the game. So at Battleborn obviously it was a big effort to try and convert a lot of Borderlands fans to go play that game. Obviously maybe it didn't work out as well as they would have hoped. But here, I mean, they've basically got a captive audience for Borderlands 3 but their entire booth, wall to wall, is stations for people to play the game, um, which is really cool. And I think this is a, a really good sort of window into how uh, powerful E3 could be if it was more of a consumer-focused show um, in a way that, like, you know, five years ago, you would never have seen this many stations at any booth. So it's cool seeing Gearbox bringing that PAX sort of community mentality uh, to the E3 show floor. Felipe! You work in the industry and you're also one of our patrons. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Uh, go to patreon.com slash noclip now to be as cool as Felipe. Um, so you've, uh, you're have you based in Madrid, right? Yeah. So you come to E3 every year? Yeah, every year. Cool. So what, what do you do exactly? Uh, we distribute games to retail. So, so why why come here? Like, why, why isn't this something you could do remote? I mean, you could, but it's always great to be face to face. Right. You know, also hang out, party a little bit. Yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. So and, and you never know. I mean, you meet new people. You know, you get new leads, so... So how many E3s have you been to? Can you count? my eighth in a row. Eighth? Yeah. You're saying it, it feels different, right? Like, yeah, less less crowded? Less crowded, less games, it seems. Well, right. Sony's not here. Yeah. Because it's, it's easier to walk around, and it's just turn 12, which means the, the gamer passes are just coming in. But even now, it, it's not like there's that many people coming in. Yeah. Um, it's easier to walk around, but does it feel like it's lost a bit of the magic, or...? Yeah, yeah? it does. Like, there's something in the air that's not the same, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. While most of the E3 activity traditionally happens inside the LA Convention Center, in recent years, increasing amounts of fringe events have spilled out into the neighboring areas. One publisher, Devolver Digital, rents a car park across the road from the convention, with game demos, food trucks, and robot beer coolers. While the nearby open-air square of LA Live houses not only the Microsoft Theater, but a stage for Mixer, a second stage for GameSpot, and live stream studios for both YouTube and Twitch. E3 is watched by more people than ever before, thanks in many ways to the growth of Twitch. So while we were waiting for an interview, we decided to pop into their on-site and get a tour from an old friend. All right, friends, we are inside of Twitch. Mary Kish, my old colleague, how are you doing, my friend? Oh, I'm doing really good, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you for inviting us into your home, uh, the home of live streaming, uh, and letting us see uh, everything that's, that's going on here. So, I guess, like, what, what's Twitch's uh, mission at E3? Like, what, what's, what, what, what are you guys doing here? What are you doing here? What's your job? I mean, we all have, like, so many different jobs here. Twitch's entire purpose at this one is to just put on a good stream for the people at home because right. the name of the game for Twitch is co-streaming. Right. Co-streaming is, like, basically anyone who's at home can actually, like, take Twitch's feed and put it on their channel and then talk over it. So we do all the uh, press conferences right. on Twitch and you can like talk over them. And then for the next three days, we're just hanging out doing demos and hanging out with partners. So cool. we're not on the show floor because we can do so much more here and have like a tighter stream right. off like not at the convention center. So were you guys open before E3 was open then as well? Because E3 was only only opens on Tuesday, so presumably doing it off-site allows you much more freedom with your working hours and stuff? We've been here since last Wednesday. Wow. So I run around with partners on the expo floor where we're not streaming and um, our host, Umi no Kaiju or any other Twitch partner runs around, plays games with me and like talks about them and then we edit them and they go on the live stream the next day. Cool. So that means you're done today because because tomorrow is the last day of E3. I'm off the clock and... <laughs> nice. uh, if, depending on how long this video goes, I'll be drinking. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so let's make this a quick tour then. What are we calling this? The, I don't know. Mount Kappa more probably. <laughs> That's pretty good. These are our emotes. I was standing in front of it earlier and somebody like came up with a photograph camera and I was like, oh, a fan. <laughs> they were like, do you mind? I was like, oh, sorry. Get out of the just, way, Danny. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> these are emotes. <laughs> <laughs> They're way more popular than Everybody you. Everybody wants these. Yeah, so these are uh, a lot of Twitch streamers. Um, and just different shows that we've run on Twitch over the years. So this is being live streamed at the moment as well as yeah, posted so here? Yeah, so this is live and you'll see that we have a, peach, uh, a partner, that's Okadrian. So he's a Twitch partner and uh, he streams full time on Twitch. 
We bring him in here. He's doing awesome interviews. So with, for a lot of streamers, would this be the first time that they've had the opportunity to like do like professional style interviews with people? A lot of our partners, when we give them these opportunities, it's like a really good way to kind of just get them out there and get their reels going so they can hopefully do more of that work. Right. Um, I mean, that's like a huge part of it, right? Is like hopefully like they build themselves here and then Go on kind of out. Yeah, we yeah. love them. We, I mean, the bigger they are, the better. Their success is our success. So when OK Adrian kills it on stage, that's good for everybody. This right. is the lounge. It's um, very loungy. I like yeah. your. I, I'm a big fan of a. Of the money pants. Of uh, the purple. No, just any any um, any uh, carpet. Nintendo always has the carpet in the the West Hall. Yeah. And the South Hall, we found that uh, Fortnite had good carpet. <laughs> so Twitch is the best. Uh, Is it lush LA enough Live. for you, Danny? It's real good. Get in there. Um, we restreamed streamers. Yeah. So kind of funny. Drop frames. And drop frames. Yeah. We basically restreamed their pre and post show reactions, cool. which was cool. And they didn't come here. They did that from right. their yeah, homes yeah. and their studios. We restreamed them from here. And now that that's done, we do the demos and interviews here because everybody's here. It's funny you say that as well because the big difference between GameSpot from when we worked there and, and this year is that they also did all their pre and post show stuff from headquarters in San Francisco. So half the video team is still up there. Yeah, technology which, has come so far yeah. that now we don't always have to be like in a room together. So now we've gone to the stage where the technology is so good that not even the people who are covering E3 need to be at E3. One of like the weird things that I think about is like eight years ago, when we like tried to even get into this industry was that you needed so many credentials and you needed a yeah. butt ton of equipment to be able to stream a press conference. It was only for the elite. It was only for like five companies. And now anyone who has internet can do it. Yeah. And so if there wasn't an, enough avenues for people to co-stream or stream from their own home, they can also stream from here? That's right. Being here doesn't get you out of streaming, Danny. <laughs> we make them stream anywhere. This These guys are streaming building a PC. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I can't I imagine anything more stressful to do. I know. It's really tense and in a really weird environment, but it's crazy to see what people watch as well. Even outside of the gaming sphere, from like dancing to cooking and like IRL now, people are streaming whatever and it's awesome. <laughs> Going to the bathroom and the conference. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> for a year as well. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, is some good um, so it means I'm good in keeping secrets. It, yes. No, also it means maybe you need to have a chat with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> So what are the stress points? What are the things you're worried about? Is it not getting the message across? Is it stuff I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's always, first of all, expect the unexpected. So um, we got to prepare amazing demo because fundamentally we always here to show the game. Okay, so that, that's the internal sort of production part, but then it's how it will be perceived and uh, we can have the best demo. We have to present it uh, the right way to get the, the points across. Uh, at a certain moment of presenting the game. So it's the second E3, we've shown Cyberpunk for the first time, so we're focusing on, on, on different elements, more showcasing the world and the general feeling of how the game will play. And this year we went very, very deep into gameplay and, and the mechanics. Getting all that in place, uh, it's, it's never easy and, and we work and polish till the very last moment. So that's the first part, so like sort of uh, the self-imposed stress. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the second part is you go out here, you show it, of course you're a judge and that's okay, but then all the other people, all the other biggest companies in this industry, they also do exactly the same. They come with their best stuff, they want to shine. So you're up against everybody else uh, who shows up here. And you never know. You never know if there won't be a sudden surprise, uh, a change of trend. Uh, so when it comes to the demo itself, like when is that getting fashioned together? Because we were talking to, to uh, Pablo Sasco earlier and he said like they were even fixing some audio stuff um, uh, in Venice like only a couple of days ago. Yeah, just to it's, tweak it's it still the very last moment and uh, we even tweak it during the show. Right. So we get, uh, you know, the, there are so many elements that go into it. So we think, okay, uh, first of all, this is for the purpose of the presentation here. So it, uh, it is real part of the game, but we need to flash out certain things. So uh, if in the game, the area was uh, more empty and that was okay because you had this living, breathing world for the last, I don't know, 15 hours. Mm. Suddenly, if we just start from that, we have to put a little bit more life to it or attack it from a little bit different angle. So it, it is a presentation. So people come here for the uh, 45, 50 minutes and they want to show what the game is going to be like. Uh, and they see only this 50 minutes. Tell me about the quest from the very center of Witcher 3. And you, you start going like, you know, all these characters, why you are doing this and that and all the motivation. Why here we, we have to build all that in order to showcase it. Because if we would just show just the cut out slice of the game, people say like, I don't know, I don't understand that. I think that that would be probably uh, the most common uh, comment. Yes. E3, uh, you have all the media from every single country in the world. So we actually try to cover every single angle of uh, what we're doing. So obviously, first and foremost, showing the game. That's the most important. So we have our developers, presenters, uh, then uh, we're inviting media, so all the PR teams, and then our PR and community people from all the countries in the world, and we have quite a few. So a huge team here, uh, talking to all the journalists and inviting them, leading them through, looking after them. Um, and making sure you know they get to the presentation if they have any questions, the questions are answered. And then the dev team, they give a lot of interviews, so it's pretty much non-stop. And again, they cover all the media, the world, so the interviews are back to back from early morning to late night. Uh, then we have uh, the business team, uh, including myself, so we have a lot of business meetings talking to our partners in the regions. And then we also, as we are a publicly uh, listed company, we have investors uh, coming here to take a look at the game. And actually, I, I sometimes participate um, in these meetings and it is very different if you do that in a, sorry, boring boardroom somewhere in New York or London. Right. But here, we actually first put them into the demo and then we talk. And then they, 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 it's totally a different world. They get we the say, experience. hey, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is what we'll be bringing to the market. Do you like it or not? And then we start the conversation from games. Actually, the, the beauty of E3 is that it connects all of it together. I think well, what, what I would like to see more, and uh, I don't think that the LA Convention Center is, is, is big enough, to see more, more gamers. So I think if, if you look at the, the show um, construction, I think the, the, the most convenient spot for us, although it's not it in terms of the reach, is, is Gamescom. Right. Because 
you no have shortage this, of space there. Yeah, you, you have a huge hall, actually a couple of halls just for the business. And you have quiet business meetings and you know you can show it to the media to the press. And then you have three hundred thousand or last year I think three hundred almost fifty thousand gamers from, from all around the region. And that's amazing. And Here, they split the days as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's I think it's 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 a super cool concept and I I think it could very well work for, for, for E three, but then it wouldn't be a LA convention center, which is super convenient. Yeah. Right. Martian and his team have been doing interviews all week, and as the online conversation around the studio and the game evolves, so too do the questions. Said that project is one of a number of studios where the conversation around industry crunch often surfaces. And during the week of E3, some artwork in the game came under fire from game players in the trans community. I wanted to know how the team reacts to instances like this, not just in terms of how the PR department puts out fires, but if the developers themselves are reactive and receptive to this type of feedback. But before we go back to Martin, I want to introduce the competitor on the other side of the ring, Kotaku reporter Jason Schreier. It is the final day of E3, so uh, what better person to talk to than, uh, I don't know, what we call him, Leak Master himself? Press Leak Fuck. <laughs> Fresh, fresh Good sneak fuck. Back. Good to see you, Danny. Good to see you. Thank you for having me here. Let's uh, let's wind it back a week. Uh -huh. So uh, before E3, a bunch of leaks. Generally, we we tend to get some information before uh -huh. the fact. Uh -huh. I don't know. It seemed like uh, like like I don't know. The, the boat was sinking almost. Like a week oh my god, the it show was started. crazy. Yeah, there were a few different things that happened, and often it happens in a few different ways. The biggest one is always the retail leaks, and that's like how Watch Dogs Legion came out. Was like Amazon UK Watch Dogs Legion, and that always seems to happen. Like somehow these. I had a conversation with someone who's like a fucking like these fucking uh, supermarkets are leaking our shit like so that was one thing and then there was I think it was Friday night that someone found a way to access Namco Bandai or Bandai Namco whichever it is these days their website someone sent me a link and it was just like like a bunch of web code it was just like a giant wall of text of web code and if you actually read every line like you could see Elden Ring and Nino Kuni remaster and Tales of Arise so that was all their stuff leaked so yeah, there are a lot of uh, a lot of different types of leaks that are covered in different types of ways. I mean, one of your last interviews of the week was with uh, Martin Novinsky, who yes. we just talked to. So yeah, I just spoke uh, to him a few hours ago. You answered him the, the asked him the tough questions. I drilled him a little bit. Yeah. He what was, was it like? Uh, what was it like? I mean, I, I when I interview somebody. Um, I think there's a, you have to find a balance, especially for a podcast interview, you have to find a balance between like making sure that you're not like really making them feel uncomfortable and also asking tough questions, right? So you have to be polite about it. You can't just be, sit there and be an asshole. Otherwise, first of all, they will never answer your questions. Second of all, they will just leave. Like nobody, when somebody is being interviewed by you, they're giving you their time. So even if you are like me, like a super cynical, like skeptical reporter who wants to be asking tough questions all the time, you still, there's still a balance between like, like the probing and being a human being, right? So when I talk to someone like Marcia Nowinski, who, and kudos to him for like sitting down, like Andrew Wilson and Bobby Kotick are not sitting down and talking to people, right? right? About their labor practices. But when I talk to someone like him about like crunch and about racial stereotypes and about the transgender controversies that they've been involved in, um, it's, uh, you have to, the, I have to find like a, a line between really going at him and like making him feel uncomfortable and uh, also like, like being a human being. So I have to like basically ask the tough questions without being too much of a dick about it. Right. That's that's my philosophy in general. Uh, how are, have you done many press interviews since you got here? Yeah, a few, yeah. yeah. Have you had a lot of people asking about crunch, I imagine? Yeah, do as you, always. How do, yeah, how, I mean, how do you, do you, when that happens, like, do you guys have a, like, like a, do you prepare for that stuff in, in Warsaw before you come out here to, to have a sort of a answer to those questions? Do yeah, you kind of we know always, what the press are gonna ask? Actually, I mean, no, press uh, is always asking what they want to ask, so it's, it's full freedom, but we know the directions and we always try to prepare ourselves uh, or, you know, from, from every single angle as much as we can. You know, we want to give competent answers and yeah. It, it must be an interesting situation to go into where they know the interview they're getting when you walk in the door. You don't have like an element of surprise no. or, or anything like an that. An element of surprise isn't a good thing a lot of the time. I don't really believe in the type of journalism where you like go up to someone and stick a microphone in their face. And in fact, I like, so when I, whenever I run any sort of like deep dive feature, investigative report, whatever else, I always make sure that the companies or the subjects involved have as much time as possible to comment on it and like right, yeah. give any, any sort of responses they want to give. I very much believe in like no surprises journalism. That's my style is like you, you deserve the time to think about an answer. You deserve the time to, to talk to me and like give me your side of the story about whatever I am tackling. 
you know, in the heat of the moment, right, you're here with a big team, there are like reactions being written up, both in the press and then with forums and everything, and people are coming up with uh, with uh, criticisms or things that they're highlighting. Yeah. Is there Are there teams that are like looking at that stuff and addressing them in the moment, or is it the type yeah. of thing that you kind of, once you go back to Warsaw, we'll look at all this you stuff? You know, to a certain extent, we always like the biggest things that are surfacing, we try to address them uh, um, sort of live. Uh, and we see, you know, what's floating. Maybe there is a major concern, uh, and as we are quite visible yeah. this year, then, you know, obviously we are under a lot of radars. Right. Uh, but then, you know, th th there's, all, there's so many comments, uh, so many questions that as much as the community teams would love to, you know, they are not able to address everything. So part of it is done here. I think the biggest, the hottest things, uh, and then the rest uh, we address back home. So actually we analyze all the feedback. I mean, we go through all the articles and we, I mean, so the surveys are analyzed daily. So the comments go to the studio and even like after the first day, we had a lot of comments here and we tweak quite a few things in the demo. So the second day experience was different than the first day experience. Uh, but then we all sort of put it into, in, in, into one file and then go through it and, and, and address it in the game. And I think this, this feedback is invaluable. And then obviously we look at the media reactions, we measure it, uh, and then we try to do better next time. There's a lot of interesting insights coming from like the trans community around cyberpunk yeah. sp specifically. They sort of have a, an interesting lens through which they view it. Is that the sort of stuff that you also? Everything, yeah. like, like, like everything. This, this actually we were addressing uh, at the show. So Kasia, who's responsible for the in-game in ads, she was uh, commenting it live to, I believe it was Polygon, mm -hmm. and then there was articles. So that was one of the things that needed to be addressed here and we wanted to, to, to to have like an immediate reaction, not to leave it hanging out there. And then, you know, so so the, the f so there's the first layer, like the media uh, comments, then um, obviously what we see here, the surveys, and then we try, uh, we, we, we read all through the comments from the gamers and, and work on that as well. So, I mean, okay, the doors are closing. Doors like are closing, time minutes, to go. I think, like pretty, pretty soon. fly back. What, what's your last thing you do before you swap coasts? This. Just this, this is, is this? My last thing. No, my last thing is, Hanging out, going out to dinner, hanging out with people at the JW. That's where I'll be. Cool. Yeah. I'll see you at the JW. A couple of cocktails. There you go. Weaver. There you go. Jason, there you pleasure. Go. Thank you, Danny, Thank you so as much. always. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you still enjoy E3? Yeah, I do. Actually, I do a lot. I do enjoy, especially the last day. We actually have it at, uh, at our office uh, for the second time, because last year we started it. We, we, we have a small party, so we have a food truck, we'll have some beers with all the people, and we'll, uh, we'll have a We'll have a nice toast to E3, and yeah. But it's 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 a great show. I think it's it's amazing that there is a place in the world when everybody in gaming comes over. Games are vibrant. There is more and more players with passion, with interest, and I would like to to see it flourish and grow. Mm. And uh, fingers crossed, the last E3 we'll see Cyberpunk at. Ah, Danny. <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Marty. Thank Pleasure you very much. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. E3 has changed a lot over the past 25 years and the noticeable slump in attendees this year is many people concerned for the future of the expo. Perhaps it should become a consumer show, maybe it's time to say farewell to the LACC, or is the future of E3 entirely digital, pre-recorded press conferences and live coverage broadcast from all over the world? E3 is an industry expo run by a lobbying group that takes place in busy, sweaty downtown LA. But even so, E3 is still kind of magic to me. Maybe it's the people, the familiar faces and strangers all running around, smiling, exhausted. Maybe it's the optimistic nature of it all, a unified thumbs up for the future of our hobby. In any case, I hope we've managed to give you some of that magic, to help you imagine what it must be like to be at the show, work the show, and cover the show. So, that was E3 2019. We've talked to the press, we talked to influencers, we talked to developers, all about what it's like for them covering the Electronic Entertainment Expo. And hopefully, through those conversations, you got an insight into what it's like being here. All right, it's about 90 minutes left until they close these doors, and it's not all that busy, so I'm gonna go try and play myself one of these new video games. Thanks for hanging out with us this year. We'll see you in 2020. Hopefully.
munchies over here. I got the selfie. 